Do you want to have a garden that supports wildlife but still looks good and the way you want it to look? Gardening recently has become very polarised between those who want really quite a wild looking garden in order to support wildlife and those who believe that a garden is a managed space and they want things like herbaceous borders and topiary. Well, you don't have to choose, you can have both. It's Alexandra here from the Middle Sized Garden YouTube channel and blog, and I went down to Great Dixter, which is one of the most influential gardens in the world, certainly when it comes to a beautiful herbaceous long border, and also when it comes to biodiversity. And I spoke to the chief executive, Fergus Garrett, about what we can do in our gardens to have that same level of biodiversity while still having the gardens that we really love. One of his points is that although Great Dixter is a large garden, it's six acres and it's set in beautiful countryside, so in some ways it's easier for it to be biodiverse. He believes that all the elements there can be reproduced in town and city gardens as long as there are lots of different town and city gardens. So you might have one town garden that is very rewilded and that'll be great, but another which is neat with short grass which appeals to certain insects. I understand you've been running a biodiversity audit for several years and you found that one of the most biodiverse places is the long border and the most biodiverse place is the barn garden. And I think a lot of people feel they have to be very wild if they're going to support nature and everything. But can you explain how these very actually managed places that look really gorgeous and any of us would like them in our garden are also very biodiverse? I think diversity is the key. So if you have an area that's a short lawn and then another area that's long meadow grass or, or you have an area that maybe will be wild with brambles and things like that next to an area which is garden that has dahlias and begonias and those sort of things. I mean that gives you diversity so and and with diversity comes the biodiversity because there are a variety of habitats and a variety of food sources. I think it's also really important to not to think that just because the long border has got a large number of insects on it that it's better than another place because one does feed into another and really what you want is that mosaic structure so and I think that's why it was so lovely at Dexter when we examined the whole estate including the woodlands and the pasture land and the meadows and the borders and the buildings that the, and we thought initially that the garden was going to be low in numbers because everything would be out in the long grass areas but actually it turned out that the garden was extremely rich in fact it had the sort of highest numbers of, of certain species in there and, and that it played a key part in, in all of this and, and so then we turned our attention to why that is and it was because there were obviously there's a long season of, of food for, for things here because we have from snowdrops right the way through to late flowering asters there's some pollen and nectar over a long season but also that there was just such a sort of diverse range of habitats from uh, little nooks and crannies amongst paving stones to dry stone walls to little cracks in the buildings and, and to water to detritus rich areas behind the borders to flower rich heavily tended areas that are worked over and bedded out yeah, to areas that perhaps haven't been worked over but that, are, that have remained relatively static you know that that are just maybe shrubs and scrub areas that that we leave be you know so so we had a whole range of habitats with a long season of pollen and nectar along with the countryside that was just right next door and, and you thought well actually if this happens at a place like Dexter why can't that mosaic system and that diversity of habitats and and with, with people's gardens being the long border or the barn garden, why can't that be mimicked in a town and city? It's very, you know, it's the same thing, isn't it? You know, we have short, short grass and people have short lawns and we have long areas and you can have long areas in a town and city as well. Not all of it has to be long, but, you know, you can have a mixture of long and short grass. Um, we cut erratically and people cut their grass erratically as, as well. We have borders, people have borders in their, in their back gardens and, and we have woodland edge planting on the edge of the wood as it comes into the garden and people, you certainly get that in towns and cities as well. So, so, so it can be mimicked, you know, and, and so it made me think, actually it's, it does relate to what can happen outside of Dexter and that's why it was so exciting. 
And when it comes to managing some of the borders, like in the barn garden or in the long border, is there anything special you do with things like compost? Do you use fertiliser? I mean, how in the soil do you actually manage that? I think soil's key to this. But first of all, I, I must say, the most important thing is that you don't use chemicals, you don't use any sides, you know, no insecticides or pesticides. And, and that was really key to us because um, when we first stopped using them, we thought, oh, there's going to be, you know, we're going to be overrun with pests and diseases. And we weren't in the first year that obviously we had a few aphids and things, but it sort of balanced itself out because every time you spray, you're not only getting rid of the, the bad things, but you're getting rid of the good things as well. So. And so far, and many years on, we seem to have a really lovely balance because there's a prey-predator balance here. So I think that's key, not to spray, you know. I think the other thing is we try and cut down the amount of fertilizer we, we use, you know. So anything that comes out of a bag, and we do it with organic waste rather than it having a sort of inorganic fertilizer. We used to, in the old days, use things like grow more, but we don't, you know. Then we went on to using fish blood and bone, bone meal, which is organic, and then we thought we don't actually need that at all because our ground is rich. We add a lot of organic matter to it, so do we need to supplement it with all this sort of extra feed? So we cut that out, and it didn't make any difference. You know, things grew perfectly well. And so organic matter is very important to us. But, but again, if I was on growing stuff on shingle, on a beach, rather, rather like the gardens you get on Dungeness and things like that, I wouldn't want to use any organic matter. I would use the right plant in the right place that's absolutely adapted to those conditions. But here, right in the middle of the wheels, you know, with the sort of rolling countryside around us and we're on the woodland edge, I think um, putting that compost on is, has been key key not only for the quality of the soil and all the mycorrhiza and everything that's in there so our soil is very healthy it's also been key because um, it means that we don't have to wa water week in week out you know the long border this this year has been watered three times last year in the drought it was only watered four times you know I think this year we could have got away with just watering it twice and so so you know because you've got this really wonderful root systems as a result of having rich soil but also the mycorrhiza tapping into the roots and making that root area much bigger as, as, as well so so I think we're, what we're finding is that we use less and less of stuff that we have to buy in you know that it's, 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 it's much more circular than it, than it used to be which is which is wonderful. With the compost, um, obviously you can make your own garden compost here. Do you also use well-rotted garden manure, or what would you use if you can't make all the garden compost you need? Well, we make some of our own, but that stuff never is enough. So we have to buy in. And so what we're looking for is buying in something that's a byproduct or a waste product that's organic, that hasn't got chemicals in it. And, and from wherever you are, that, that sort of varies. But we're very fortunate in that there is a, a organisation that makes electricity with green waste and and so we get the sort of the byproduct of that so we get this wonderful compost relatively cheap that's actually been used in the green industry and and it's only just a stone's throw away from us and sometimes we use composted bark from the various industrial forestry areas that we had around us that isn't so good because it ha hasn't really broken down enough but you could buy it and let it sit somewhere and you'll make perfectly good compost with, with that of course you can use farmyard manure as well as long as you know what's what's in it you know as long as you you know that um, very often it's riddled with weed seed but if I didn't have anything to use any alternative I'd use farmyard manure yeah. and in terms of plant choices how do you decide that how much do you take into account wanting to be biodiverse and wanting to be wildlife friendly and how much is it gosh we really love that flower let's have that Dix is a big garden it's about six acres in total so there's room for everything, and w but we've never ever chosen something because it was good for pollinators. We've just chosen something because we like the look of it, or it would fit into our scheme of planting. If I had a small garden and I wanted a garden for wildlife, of course I'd, I'd choose things that were pollinator friendly. You know, things that were single flowers rather than doubles, and so on. And you know, there are certain things that really attract the various bees and and and, and butterflies. So you'd make a sort of beeline for those but here we've never ever gone down that route because we think variety is key and there are sort of things that will 
like alliums and anything in the carrot family, that will actually attract a large range of flying insects. And they're almost like landing pads that they can land on. But then there are sort of obscure things that we grow that will be sort of very specific for certain insects. So we, we like the diversity here. And we find that it's not just the diversity of flowers, but the diversity of activities. So, you know, we don't mind growing annuals, for instance, because that's, that's, that sort of mimics cornfield habitats for instance. It doesn't all have to be perennials or shrubs or, or woodies. It, it's, we grow a whole range of plants. And I think you also said that you have allowed certain weeds to creep in. So what's your approach to weeding? We weed, you know, we don't, um, but I, I didn't allow things to creep in because they increased the wildlife value. I allowed cow parsley to come into the borders because I thought it was a beautiful plant. That was the reason for doing that. I allow buttercup to come to certain areas because I think it's a beautiful plant. And same with dandelions. You know, we're not overrun with them. I suppose cow parsley does get a bit heavy sometimes, but we cut it down before it seeds it everywhere. But I just love the garden floating in that sort of white, white mist at cow parsley time. And I don't even know what insects go on it, you see. So it's a very much an aesthetic thing, that decision. And the same with the buttercups as well. I love those buttercups at that time, that sort of g that deep yellow amongst fritillaries and those sort of things popping up in the borders here and there. And, and they're the sort of the main weeds, inverted commas, that we're allowed to come in. You know, one person's weed is another person's perfectly good garden plant. And is it just hand weeding or do you do anything with a flame torch? I mean, I presume you obviously don't use weedicides. It's all hand weeding, but the borders are pretty packed. So once you, once you weed them, you, it's easy to stay on top of them. Things like bindweed can be a problem, you know, um, because their roots go everywhere. And we've had a bindweed problem in the high garden. But, um, you know, I'm, you know I'd, I'm not at that stage where I think it's a beautiful plant. You know, I, I've got a neighbour who thinks it's a beautiful plant, who lets it grow, and, and she even goes down, out there and, and waters it, which I think is <laughs> rather nice, <laughs> but it's not, it's not for us. And then, speaking of watering, you said you only watered the long border once this year and only four times in that really hideously long, hot summer we had. So how do you go about watering? Do you water it just very, very thoroughly, but very rarely? So we watered um, long water twice this year, yes, and four times in the drought. And what we do, each watering is a two hour spot. So we have a, 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 a small, just a tiny sprinkler that fits in under the vegetation. So it's not over the top. It's under the vegetation, we put it there, and it just sort of dribbles out this, this, this sort of spray of wa water for two hours, and then we move it to the next spot. So it's had, in essence, the long water this year has had four hours of water, and that's and that's it. Partly because plant choice is important. So if something was needing watering every single week, we wouldn't, we wouldn't grow it here because it's just not for us, it's for somewhere else. So right plant, right place comes first. And uh, the soil quality is important as well to allow a big root development, which is uh, very important. And I think on time of planting, we water really thoroughly and mulch immediately afterwards. So we'll dig out, you know, we won't just put a little bit of water. Um, we give it a really thorough soaking and then we mulch it so that the moisture stays deep down and the roots develop deep down as well. And is there anything about sort of pruning and deadheading and things that you would do differently if you're wanting to attract wildlife? Would you just prune and deadhead as you would otherwise? Well, I think detritus has a value. So we don't go in the autumn and cut everything down at once. We do it very slowly. So some of the cut down um, begins in the autumn, but it will go on till March, so things can lay their eggs or, or feed off the seeds and so on. So I think that sort of slow knocking down of browns is, is, is important for us. And I think they look rather beautiful as, as well. I know other people have sort of experimented, they said that if anything lays its eggs in the old stems of a perennial, they'll do it in the first sort of six inches, so they cut their perennials down you know, uh, and just leave six inches of, of, of dead stem standing. We, we don't go to that, we cut it right down to the, to the ground. And, and it was interesting with the biodiversity audit because when we asked our sort of lead ecologist what we should do differently in the garden, and he just said, no, just carry on as you are because you're doing, you know, what you're doing seems to be really working. But we're careful, you know, we're careful. We don't cut things down unnecessarily, and that goes with our meadow areas as well. We leave certain areas of meadow standing for one year, two years, three years, and then cut it down so that we have a diversity of, of habitats. 
And you've just done a project, haven't you, to listen to all this diversity. You've got a, an audio project that will be coming in 2024, where people can actually listen to all the sounds of Great Dixter, from people talking to the chomping away inside the habitat pile, yeah. which is the most amazing sound. It's all this little chompy, 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 chompy yeah. bits. And the habitat pile, if you tell me, how would someone in a smaller garden build a habitat pile like that? Well, rather than burn prunings and wood, they just pile stuff up. I know people who actually use logs to create walls and divisions in their, in their border, but just a, just a pile of logs rotting down somewhere would be, is, it creates a habitat. They don't have to be the massive piles that we've got at Dixter. I mean, I built big ones at Dixter because I wanted to mimic Hungarian haystacks, you know, that's what I wanted, and they look rather like that. And I wanted to have a no-burn policy because I wasn't sure, you know, we used to pile up all the, all the prunings and then burn it, and I d wasn't sure whether we had slow worms in there or hedgehogs in there and whatever, and I thought it was just completely unnecessary. So let's just let all of this just die down naturally. So, and of course we've got the space to put a big heap like that, but you could always tuck these things away at the back of borders or behind plantings or behind a shed and just let wood rot. And there's a sort of whole succession of insects that comes as a result of that, you know, the, the initial wood bearers and things that live underneath the bark and then something else and something else. And, and then, then all the sort of the predators of the detritivores come. And, and this is why it was so interesting to put that microphone into the habitat pile and hear all these things that are sort of chumping away and you know that there's a whole sort of microcosm of, of, of predators waiting to get those things as well. So the whole world opens up in, in, in front of you, that world in a, in, a, in, a, in a pile of old wood. I thought we'd all like to hear what happens when you put a microphone into a habitat pile. So the people running the project, Sound Matters, have very kindly let us listen to a short stretch of it. It'll just take a few seconds. <laughs> So what about moss, fungus, algae and things like that? Because I, I love the sort of sense of wear and seeing moss on top of stones and how does all that fit into how you garden here at Dixter? I love it too and, and that's part of being an old garden. You know, things weather very nicely and that weathering is not only just softening with the weather but they, they get completely um, habited by, by all these amazing things and and I think what the audit did was made us look at them closer and made made us sort of um, be more aware of them the little speckles that you get on the wood and so on and the patterns you can so there's a sort of real deep beauty in, in all of these and we were told by our head lichen person not to prune dead wood in, in the orchard and we were always reluctant to prune deadwood in the orchard anyway but um, because he just showed us a number of really rare lichens on there that exist on those trees and so that's why when you come to Dixter you look at the orchard trees that there'll be elements of deadwood around and, and this sort of extraordinary beauty of, of these sort of things that, that are made that, that habitat their home. So we're, we're in favour of them. The stones have got lovely patterns of lichen on them and, and Mosses are really interesting as, as, as well. So I think uh, just as a gardener, uh, being more aware of those things makes the garden more interesting. Is there any other advice that you might have? Think about diversity. So have water. That's always good. You know, and when you build your pond, make sure you build it in such a way that there, there are shells within it so things can get in and get out. I think it's, it's nice to, to have little openings in your gates and, and so that things can cr crawl in and crawl back out again. Uh, don't worry about brown seed heads and things like that, the birds will en enjoy them. Gardening for a long season really helps as well. You know, and this is why Dixter works really well because we've had that sort of succession planting where we plant, you know, underplant everything with bulbs. So when the queen bees come out of hibernation, they've got crocuses to feed on. You know, if you look at the asters now and the ivies that are flowering, the tree ivies that are flowering in the garden, they're just, just alive with all those sort of bee flies and bees and wasps and things like that. So just be open to, to growing a lot, wide range of Things and just cram it, cram it full of, full of, full of stuff and, and maybe not clear away all the leaves and if you do clear away the leaves maybe you tuck them at the back of the border. Some people are always worried about leaves and you had to be clean because they, they, they were, that's where the slugs used to lay their eggs but actually the predators live amongst those as, as well so you know if you want that balance in your garden then perhaps that, some of that detritus you can hide away in the back somewhere and, and that will be of, of, of benefit. And I think also exciting is actually start 
educating yourself about, you know, what is the bumblebee that you're looking at? You know, is it a buff tail or something else or something else? And maybe you should, you know, start with something like bumblebees that are only 20 odd species or 24 species so you can start identifying them. And that, you know, you then get drawn into this, this, this new world, which makes it really exciting. You know, the first time I set a moth trap uh, where you should have a bright light and a sheet and the moths come to that. It was just extraordinary because I never knew there were so many varieties of moth. You know, over 300 varieties of moth or something in the UK, maybe more than that actually. And um, whereas there's only 50 species of butterfly, but there's a whole sort of nightlife opened up in front of your eyes. So enthuse yourself and be inquisitive about it and you, you'll get drawn into it. If you'd like to know what else you can do in your garden to help wildlife, then don't miss this interview with the Royal Horticultural Society's Senior Wildlife Specialist and Principal Horticultural Advisor in this video coming up now. And thank you for watching. Goodbye.